Okay, now we're ready to, to look at the passage from the Gospel of Mark. And while uh, Pat Davis reads that for us, if you will uh, uh, jot down any words or phrases that strikes you. Uh, okay, all yours, Pat. The Gospel of Mark. He said, this is how it is with the kingdom of God. It is as if a man were to scatter seed on the land and would sleep and rise night and day, and the seed would sprout and grow. He knows not how. Of its own accord, the land yields fruit, first the blade, then the ear, then the full grain in the ear. And when the grain is ripe, he wheels the sickle at once, for the harvest has come. He said, to what shall we compare the kingdom of God? Or what parable can we use for it? It is like a mustard seed that, when it is sown in the ground, is the smallest of all the seeds on the earth. But once it is sown, it springs up and becomes the largest of plants and puts forth large branches so that the birds of the sky can dwell in its shade. With many such parables, he spoke the word to them as they were able to understand it. Without parables, he did not speak to them, but to his own disciples, he explained everything in private. Okay, thank you. So any words, phrases, or images that come to you, <clears throat> be sure to unmute yourself when you share. <clears throat> As they were able to understand it. As they were able to understand it. Anyone else? I got to take my medicine earlier, so I'm going to. Time to go to work. <clears throat> okay, so uh, <clears throat> I have this outline of, of Mark, uh, and basically Mark divides into two parts. The first part is Jesus healing and teaching with power. And this, this comes from uh, Femme Perkins, uh, who wrote in uh, uh, the New Interpreter's Bible, Volume 8 of the 12-volume series. And uh, at first, I, because it's a Greek name, I thought it was Femi, but she pronounces her name Femme, and she's also a, a member of the Catholic Biblical Association and a, a, a famous scholar. Uh, uh, and she gives uh, five parts to the gospel, the, the, the first part, the, uh, the beginning of the ministry of Jesus, then uh, in chapters two and three, controversy at Capernaum, chapter four, parables of the kingdom, uh, end of chapter four, and uh, to the beginning of six, uh, the miracles around the Sea of Galilee, and then uh, up through uh, most of chapter eight, Jesus continues preaching in Galilee. Then the second part is uh, the Son of Man must suffer. And it's here where we get the three passion predictions as well as the passion narrative and resurrection. So those are the two main parts of the Gospel of Mark. So zeroing in on, on the parables uh, in chapter four, it begins with the parable of the sower. Then we have uh, the secret of the kingdom, then a series of parables. <clears throat> and then we get, uh, or excuse me, a series of proverbs, a series of proverbs in verses 21 to 25. Then we get uh, 
our, our passage today, two parables about seeds and a conclusion. That is, the parable of the seed growing by itself, verses 26 to 29, then the parable of the mustard seed, 30 to 32, and then the conclusion about Jesus' use of parables, verses 33 to 34. So that's how it's structured. And uh, give people some fish, you feed them for a day. Teach people to fish, you feed them for a lifetime. So I'm hoping to help you to appreciate parables so that rather than just focusing in on explaining these parables to give you a little background on that. First, uh, what is a parable? And I'm getting this from uh, Donahue's article in the New Jerome Biblical Commentary. So he starts with a simile compares one thing to another. Wisdom is like salt. A metaphor ascribes qualities without an explicit point of reference, like like or as. You are the salt of the earth. That's a metaphor. You are the salt of the earth. Wisdom is like salt. That's a simile. A parable, in general, it gets more complex, but in general, a parable is a developed simile. Uh, <clears throat> the story, while fictitious, is true to life, as opposed, for example, to a fable, which, uh, or, or like to Star Trek, science fiction, where they go faster than light, okay? Uh, uh, <clears throat> a, a parable is true to life, even though it's fictitious. In a parable, all of the characters and details are for the sake of the main point. Allegory uh, is a developed series of metaphors. It's less clear and more elusive than a parable. It doesn't just have one main point. Uh, uh, in an allegory, each detail or character is significant often with hidden meaning. Uh, Mark 4, uh, chapter 4, 13 to 20, the explanation of the parable of the sower is an allegory. And notice I have quotes around explanation. It's, it's not really an explanation of the parable. It's, it's an allegory. Uh, <clears throat> now, mashal, to complicate matters, the Hebrew word mashal covers a multitude of literary forms. Uh, Hebrews, when they, Jews, when they say mashal, they might mean proverb, riddle, oracle, metaphor, allegory, and many more things. This Hebrew concept is not nearly so specific as the Greek word parabola. So parables, the history of interpretation from the New Testament itself. Uh, uh, what happens is that in the, in the gospel tradition, the parables of Jesus are already getting allegorical interpretations. From the New Testament itself up to the 19th century, the tendency of preachers was to allegorize, to treat parables as if they were al allegories. Allegory was widespread in the ancient world, so we weren't just doing this from nowhere. Greek philosophers allegorized Homer. So the characters in the Homeric legends, Achilles and Agamemnon and all, they were interpreted as teaching the latest philosophical concepts, you know, like uh, courage or treachery or something, you know, uh, don't, don't take all of these silly old myths as if they're, as if they were literal history, uh, that Homer was really teaching us philosophy. And so what happens is that they, they convert uh, Homer from a great poet into a wise philosopher. Uh, and 
So Augustine, uh, uh, which Donahue calls his rather forced exegesis. I, I think that is so kind. We'll, we'll see what Fitzmaier says in a minute. Augustine's rather forced exegesis of the parable of the Good Samaritan from Luke is an example. Uh, uh, oh, darn it. Uh, Jerusalem, I, I, I need to put in more, and it's in the New Jerome, and I don't have it with me. So Jerusalem is original happiness. Jericho is the, is the fallen world that he's, he's going down there. And uh, some people are, are, are the Pharisees and some people are someone else. And so every person in there has, uh, I really have to fix this in, in my improved notes and I, I won't be able to, to do the final fix until I, ah, there is a copy of the New Jerome Biblical Commentary here. Let me, uh, let me, darn it. Uh, uh, okay, okay. And I have another one from Augustine, thanks be to God. Uh, someone once told me of his interpretation of the story in John 5 of the man who was lame for 38 years. Augustine says 40 is the perfect number, the man lacked two. He lacked one, love of God, two, love of neighbor. Now, there's no indication in John's text that the man was in any way lacking in love of God or love of neighbor. Uh, concerning the patristic allegorical interpretation of the pa parables, Fitzmaier, God rest him, used to say, admirandum non imitandum, that is, uh, their interpretation is admirandum, to be admired, non imitandum, not to be imitated. So don't any of you dare write me a paper, Fitzmaier would tell us, who, who explains a, a parable allegorically. <clears throat> uh, uh, Developments of the 19th and 20th century. A German scholar, Adolf Julicher, in 1890, began a new era. He stressed that parables have only one main point. They are not allegories. Every character, they don't stand for a whole lot of different things. There's one main point to the parable. Now, one weakness of his approach was that he considered the parables to be simple lessons in morality. And this is because 19th century liberals, their idea of the historical Jesus was a preacher of universal human brotherhood. And so these parables were simple moral lessons that were going to help human beings achieve brotherhood. Now, later scholarship began to realize that the main message of Jesus was not about the brotherhood of all people. It was his main message was the kingdom of God is about to arrive. Get ready for it. Uh, at, at times, there was an overreaction against patristic allegorical interpretations, scholars were reluctant to even consider that Jesus had used allegories. Uh, any allegory in the, New in the Gospels was automatically excluded from going back to the lifetime of Jesus. He could not have possibly said this. This is an allegory. It's not a parable. More recent awareness of the complexity of the Hebrew idea of Mashal has resulted in more flexibility here. Jesus probably did not have the Greek idea of parable. He was thinking in Jewish terms, and so it's possible he mixed proverbs and parables and maybe a little bit of allegory in as well. Uh, there are nevertheless good arguments for regarding some allegory attributed to Jesus uh, in red letters, in red letter editions, as non-authentic. And I'll say more about non-authentic shortly. So characteristics of Jesus' parables, they take their illustrations from daily life. Now, Jesus was a carpenter 
but we never get images from the carpenter shop. Most images are agricultural, and this shows great sensitivity to his, to his audience. He was a great teacher. He, he knew what images would impress them. Also, uh, novelty and paradox. So realism being taken from daily life, that's only one side of the coin. Uh, the meaning of the parable is often elusive. Uh, uh, these were not, contrary to Juliter or Euliter, uh, perfectly clear stories. Often it's elusive. And the parable is not effective until it is freely appropriated. And Donahue says, parable is a form of religious discourse that not only that appeals not only to the imagination or to the joyous perception or surprise, but also to the most basic of human qualities, freedom. In couching his message in parables, Jesus challenged people to a free response, and by doing that, he risked rejection. The kingdom of God is like this phrase is frequently misinterpreted and has been frequently misinterpreted by fathers and medieval exegetes and preachers all the way up to the 19th century. And it's only in the 20th century that we've begun to understand that the kingdom of God is, where are we here, uh, is, is not like a mustard seed, or not like a pearl, or not like a net. Rather, the underlying Aramaic means the kingdom of God is like the following case. So let's, let's do, it's like a, 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 a person who finds a treasure hidden in a, the kingdom of heaven is like a treasure hidden in a field, which a man finds and sells all that he has uh, to buy that field. Now, the kingdom of heaven is not like a treasure. It's like this case. This man has found this treasure, and everybody thinks he's crazy. He's just sold er everything he owns, and he's bought this field. And people think he's out of his mind, but he knows what's in that field, okay? And so people are, people might think that what Jesus is saying is about the kingdom of God, but those who believe, if you, if you see the truth, then you're going to have that same joy as, as if you had found a million dollars buried in a field and you, you went and sold, sold your house, which was worth a hundred thousand, and you went and, and bought that. That's what it's going to be like. Uh, so it's one main point. And uh, that's the uh, Angelicum Jeremias, the, uh, the great uh, German scholar. I read this book when I was a seminarian, The Parables of Jesus. Uh, I, I give you bibliographical information later. <clears throat> um, let's see. Uh, a note on the parable on the seed growing by itself. Uh, uh, it, it, that's the one that a man were to scatter seed on the land and would sleep and rise day and night. And through it all, the seed would grow and he knows not how. Neither Matthew nor Luke like this parable. Uh, how do we know? because they both used the, the verses 21 to 25, which come before it, and they both use the verses that come after it, but neither one of them liked this parable. I'm not sure why they didn't like it, but the corollary is just because a parable was attributed to Jesus, there was no assurance that a particular evangelist would use it. So uh, Mark says that Jesus said this parable. Matthew's writing a gospel. He has this, uh, and he decides, I'm not going to use that one. How many other parables of Jesus did Matthew decide? Well, this doesn't fit the theme of my gospel. I'm not going to use it. How many times did Luke say, 
uh, uh, that that does that that's a neat parable, but it doesn't fit what I'm trying to stress in my gospel. I'm not going to use it. <clears throat> so uh, even when evangelists leave something out, that gives us information that we can ponder. Let's just think about the process of biblical inspiration and so on. Uh, some brief remarks on uh, Mark 4, and I get these from Donahue. These parables of chapter 4 contrast appearance and reality. Three failed sowings and an extravagant harvest. The three failed uh, birds ate it, it fell on rocky ground, uh, uh, and, uh, and so on. And, but then there's an extravagant harvest, 30, 50, 100 fold. The smallest of the seeds becomes a great bush, contrasting appearance with reality. And, and they also further the Markan theme of the messianic secret. So this is why Mark liked these. They fit in with something he wants to stress anyway. And they also encourage faithful discipleship in the face of failure which was probably uh, a problem for Mark's community. Uh, many scholars think that a lot of his Christians chickened out when they saw the lions. Uh, and now the question is, what are they going to do about them? Three books about parables. I showed you the one from Joachim Jeremias, 248 pages, a classic. It's somewhat dated, but worth reading if you can find a used copy. And then... Uh, Amy Jill Levine. Okay. Short Stories by Jesus, The Enigmatic Parables of a Controversial Rabbi. She calls Jesus Rabbi. She's a Jewish scholar. And so she's going to give you a Jewish spin on a lot of these. Uh, it's 313 pages. It's scholarly, but very readable. If you have time for only one book on parables, let this be the one. Then, A Marginal Jew, Volume 5, the subtitle is Probing the Authenticity of the Parables. Meyer's goal is to determine which of the parables go back to Jesus and which were composed in his name by the early church, either by preachers uh, or by the gospel writers themselves. Spoiler alert. From So close your ears if you don't want to hear Meyer's conclusion. From the historic, historian's point of view, there is not enough evidence to decide in most cases whether a parable is authentic or not. The reason is simple. One does not have to be able to work a miracle to write a good miracle story. <clears throat> okay, I can write a pretty good miracle story, but I can't work miracles. Okay, <clears throat> You don't have to have that skill to write about it. But to tell orally in a sermon uh, or in a class or to write it down, a parable, one has to be able to compose such a parable oneself. Uh, Meyer's book, <clears throat> so, so it's precisely for that reason that we can't, uh, we can't tell. Uh, everybody who was passing these on were, had parable skill, parable telling skills, so we can't be sure which ones come from Jesus and which one come from these other early good, uh, good early Christian uh, parable tellers. Meyer's book is really for those, it's for those who are really interested in history. It's not designed for the average Catholic in the pew. I would use it in a course for seminarians or for graduate level students preparing for lay ministry in the Catholic Church. Uh, so two notes on Meyer. Authentic is scholarly for goes all the way back to Jesus. Authentic is not to be confused with true. 
from the point of view of believers, all the parables are true. Now, none of them are historical because all the stories are fictitious. But from the point of view of believers, all the parables are true, whether they come from the lifetime of Jesus or whether they were later inspired by the risen Lord. Uh, so scholars make the distinction between authentic and inauthentic, but that doesn't mean true and not true. It's just whether it goes all the way back to Jesus. Now, here's something. <clears throat> Before Meyer wrote, the parables were regarded by scholars as bedrock Jesus tradition. I see we're going a little bit over, so we'll skip with the, uh, we'll wrap this up shortly. Okay. Uh, uh, before Meyer wrote, parables were regarded by scholars as bedrock Jesus can, uh, tradition. Scholars argue whether historically Jesus actually worked miracles, whether he worked any miracles, or if so, which ones, but nobody doubted the authenticity of the parables. That was bedrock tradition. Paradoxically, Meyer has shown in volume two on the miracles that we have much more historical evidence for some of the miracles attributed to Jesus than we have for most of the parables. That what most scholars up until at least 1980 thought was bedrock tradition and what was disputable, uh, Meyer says, from studying this just as a hard-nosed historian, not as a believer, as a hard-nosed historian, there's better evidence for Jesus as a miracle worker, better evidence for certain of his healings and so on, than there is for many of his parables. So scholars, we've got to do some rethinking. So I'm going to end the recorded portion right here. Uh, so we'll stop that.